Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Anthony Dapparan, and I'm hosting our session this morning with uh, Henry Lisson on uh, the dance of folly, uh, how theatrics have tainted the rule of law in Hong Kong. Uh, before we begin this morning's session, just a, a quick plug for our upcoming session. Uh, on Tuesday next week, we have uh, what promises to be a, a very exciting session with Fongi Walker, Master of Wine, uh, on a Master of Wine's introduction to Chinese winemaking. Uh, and you'll be able to, uh, to, to drink along with that uh, fascinating session next week. So do tune in to that. Uh, but uh, to this morning, um, uh, in, is the common law as practiced in the courts today in Hong Kong fit for purpose? Uh, are the Hong Kong courts currently adhering to one country, two systems? Uh, and what might be the consequences if they are not? Uh, these are some of the key questions raised by uh, former <laughs> Judge Henry Litton in his new book, The Dance of Folly, which I'm holding up here. Um, uh, Henry Lytton was appointed to the Court of Appeal in 1992 and to the newly established Court of Final Appeal uh, at the moment of the handover, 1st of July 1997. After stepping down as a permanent judge of that court in 2000, he continued to serve as a non-permanent judge until his retirement in 2014, when he was appointed as an honorary law professor at the University of Hong Kong. A third generation Hong Konger, uh, whose first language was Cantonese, he was called to the English bar by Gray's Inn in 1959, admitted to the Hong Kong bar in 1960, uh, where he served in total seven terms as its chairman and was made Queen's Counsel in 1970. Uh, Henry's written many books on the rule of law and the courts in Hong Kong, um, including Is the Hong Kong Judiciary Sleepwalking to 2047? Uh, Can Freedom and Liberal Values Thrive if Common Law Crumbles? And now his, his latest book, The Dance of Folly. Uh, moderating the conversation with uh, Henry this morning will be Cliff Buddle, one of our governors and uh, with the SCMP. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cliff and to Henry. Thank you. Oh, uh, let me add one more thing. I'm sorry about that. If you have any questions, um, you may email your questions to question at fcchk.org. That's question, singular, at fcchk.org. Um, uh, so please do email any questions that arise in, in the course of the session this morning. And with that, over to Cliff. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Mr. Litton. Thank you for joining us uh, from Australia. Uh, it's a, a pity you... Uh, you can't be uh, with us at the, the club this time, uh, thanks to uh, uh, the pandemic and uh, the, the quarantine uh, restrictions. Um, a new book, uh, and it's now six years, I think, uh, since you delivered a speech at the FCC in Hong Kong, uh, in which you said the judiciary was sleepwalking towards 2047, uh, and uh, flirting with disaster. Judgments too long, too complicated, judicial review being abused, uh, caused a lot of people to sit up and take notice. Now, a lot has happened in Hong Kong since then. Uh, so perhaps we can start uh, by uh, considering, uh, uh, is the judiciary still sleepwalking towards a disaster? Have things improved since you started what has become a, a bit of a campaign? And uh, uh, if there are still concerns, what are those concerns? Well, um, it's very difficult to get a complete, accurate overview of the, the whole um, structure and organization and, and output of the judiciary. But certainly in relation to some of the criminal cases, which have been actually now dealt with in, in the courts, in, in particular, for example, the, the most recent one concerning the, um, the eight, where eventually became seven defendants headed by people like Martin Lee and Margaret Ng and, and so on. Um, the judgment of the district court I, I was most impressed with because it was uh, focused on the issues involved it was balanced and in a very robust way applied basic common law principles now I can understand um, 
lay people finding something like 40 or 50 pages of, of text are rather challenging. And I can understand why would, uh, Judge Woodcock actually did it that way, because it was the first, I think, of the big trials. And what she painstakingly uh, did was to explain really the background of the whole of the proceedings from the time when the first notifi notification was given of a um, proposal to assemble in Victoria Park and all the other steps that followed to eventually the police giving a no objection letter in relation to the assembly in the park, but objection in relation to the procession to uh, Chater Road and a further demonstration Chater Road they objected to. Now that was traced through with, with painstaking care. My only comment really is, is that that degree of output is so demanding on the individual judges that I don't think it's possible to actually deal with each one of these cases in the same thorough ma manner because the judges would just burn out. What I think one needs to do is to really just focus on the actual issues rather than to give the entire narrative. Now, what has been happening, I think, in a lot of the cases is that the judges lose focus. They, they don't really are not uh, focused anymore on why are these people in front of me in the dock and what are they charged with? When you begin to give a, a narrative, the focus fractures. Now, I'm not saying that Judge Woodcock's focus had fractured, but what I am saying is that a lot of that, that stuff is really not necessary for the determination has the prosecution discharges burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt on these charges, right? But in, 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 in the case of this, uh, I suppose, uh, seminal trial, the first one, I can well understand why Judge Wood, Woodcock did that. Now, you transpose that scenario to other cases and so on, such as, for example, the case concerning the West Kowloon terminal. And, and you really ask yourself when you got to page 65 or it was, what the judge is actually doing. Is this just a reportage? Is this a piece of, of <laughs> sort of job that you, the journalist, would be doing? <laughs> Rather, like brevity than, too. <laughs> rather than, than judging, judging issues. I mean, at the end of the day, a court of law is there to assert rights or have people asserting rights and incur liability. That's, that's really a court of law is dealing with rights and liabilities. Are you criminally liable? Have you asserted a right that the law protects? Now, those are the core issues in a court of law, not telling a story as large as you can keep on going. And a, a lot of the cases you see that, uh, well, I, I deal with in my book and in my previous two books, there's no focus. You, you begin to wonder, why are we talking about um, uh, Histova against Bulgaria, um, Vladivostok against Russia, um, you know, you go and read these cases, and you, what, what has this got to do with the issue in Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the fractured focus, which, which I've, you know, been criticizing. Now, someone has been, has said to me, okay, you, you're so smart, you know, you talk about the rule of law, and you say that rule of law is being abused, and so on. What would you do? <clears throat> okay. My answer is this. The rule of law is founded upon five uh, cardinal matters. Five, okay? Not one less. All right? Now, what are the five? One, effective action, not words, not just piles of words, effective action, okay? Two, discipline of law. 
that a legal process is guided by rules, such as, for example, in judicial review is guided and controlled by Rule 53 of the Rules of the High Court, which mandates the judge to follow them. Okay, so two is discipline. Three, the law has a cutting edge. It has to because it enforces rights, imposes liability. So it must have a cutting edge. And it, it, you can't just have a judgment which just, just eventually dissolves into a cloud of words, a declaration. The judge hereby declares, and I'll give you an example later. So three, cutting edge of the law. Four, the focus is always on remedies. Effective remedies, maybe uh, to compensate someone who's been injured with $10 million. It may be to fine somebody for $10 million. It's got a cutting edge. Words don't cut. Word confuse the mind usually. So four is focus on remedies. And then five, well, <laughs> you're doing this in a, a courtroom. A courtroom is a place where you determine rights and liabilities. It is not a debating hall for dialogue between counsel who comes in with piles of books and a skeleton argument, which is 100 pages long, and citation of cases from the uh, Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg for discussion of a, 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 a little problem occurring in a little place called Hong Kong. I mean, the focus is completely wrong. So, okay, five cardinal rules. The effective action, discipline of law, the law's cutting edge, focus on remedies, and the courtroom is not a debating room. Not one less. So, okay. Can I just, just come back um, on that point? Uh, I mean, I, I sat in your court, as you know, many times in the 1990s, and uh, I, I saw you dealing in a very robust manner, uh, uh, sometimes with uh, uh, counsel when you felt that uh, they wanted to put, put forward arguments you, you didn't feel uh, uh, were relevant. Um, however, in, you know, in your book, you talk about the basic law and you talk about <clears throat> lawyers playing games with the basic law. Uh, now, I, I, I wonder about that uh, because you know, in Hong Kong, as you know, we look to the basic law to, among other things, protect our rights. Uh, what, what these lawyers are doing um, the, the arguments they put forward are, are seeking to rely on the protection that the, the basic law offers uh, for those rights um, in the cases in, in which they, they are involved. Now, it, is that not legitimate? I mean, you, you say it, it, it's playing games, but isn't that, that part of, uh, of the legal process? Um, you, know, you, you talk in your book about uh, uh, the case in, involving um, the, uh, uh, the use of uh, emergency uh, uh, provisions uh, to uh, impose a ban on wearing masks at, at, at protests. I mean, were there not legitimate legal issues to, to be raised in, in a case such as that? Cliff, you've, I think, found the focus of the core problem. You said that the basic law is there to protect our rights. No, sir. It's the common law which is there to protect our rights. The set of domestic law comprising the common law, the rules of equity, the statutes, etc., embodied in Article 8 of the basic law. Now, that is the set of principles and laws which protect our rights. The basic law provides the framework in which the domestic law functions properly. And that's exactly the problem. Every time there's an issue that arises, instead of going to the common law for remedy, these lawyers go to the basic law and say, look, look at Article 28 uh, and so on. 
uh, 27, 20, uh, you know, uh, freedom of expression and so on. Or uh, I, I have a right to put, put, put up posters everywhere. Well, no. Why? You don't. It's not the basic law that determines the right as to whether you put up a poster on, 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 the, on the, uh, the wall of the chief executive's office. It, it is the, the, um, the, the statute itself uh which which governs that okay the municipal services and, and uh municipal services and something ordinance which gives the director of muni munis municipal services the right to regulate the use of public space for the purpose of putting up posters and so on it's not the basic law that regulates that activity that, that's exactly the point so every time they go to the basic law to argue a point like that, it is an abuse of the basic law. Basic law is not intended. It's a framework for the governance of the SAR. It is not a code for administering the activities of the local community, the regional community. What regulates the activities of the regional committee, the SAR, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, is the set of laws which we have inherited from colonial times and is embodied in Article 8 of the Basic Law. Not Article 27, not Article 28. No, you look at Article 8 and that gives you the entire set of laws which governs your local activities. So very rarely should you be saying that uh, something is unconstitutional. I mean, after all, <laughs> we have over a thousand pieces of statutes, right? Now, those, of course, confer rights and liabilities apart from the common law, okay? Now, if you're saying that um, something has gone wrong, you know, in a restaurant, you, 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 you have infringed uh, road traffic ordinances. You don't go to the basic law for that. But the lawyers have been doing that over the last 20 years, and the courts have allowed it. And therefore, they make a big issue of, um, I mean, I, I've dealt with, uh, for example, that outrageous case called uh, Latka in my first book, The um, uh, Sleepwalking to 27. The case of, of, of someone's car going through a red light. Do you, do you remember that case? I, I remember the case. Yes. I mean, look, you have to register to own a car. Huh? Your car registered in your name's gone over a red light. What do you, you, what do you get? A notice from the police, right? And the police will say, well, your car's gone through red lights. Tell us who is driving it, right? Now, as simple as that, that became a major piece of, 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 lit, uh, of litigation going to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal agonizing as to, you know, what, what does it mean by a charge and so on. And let's look at see what, what the Europeans have to say as to the word charge. Well, the word charge has been in the Hong Kong criminal law since day one. You don't need to, to you only go to this area of nebulous law, so called, because the whole thing is out of focus. You're not focused on the road traffic ordinance, sections 56, which says, thou shalt answer this notice or you incur a fine. As simple as that. Now, that became a major judgment in the Court of Appeal. Now, how can that be right? But if, to come back to the fundamental point, I, I think yeah, it, it's important to, to have uh, some clarity here. Um, you know, yes, we have uh, in Hong Kong, we have ordinances passed by the legislature, we have common law uh, principles established uh, uh, by the courts, uh, but all of those laws must be consistent with the basic law. Yes? yes. Uh, so when those laws are exercised, is it not legitimate to say, well, here, here we have a law, uh, which restricts human rights. Those human rights are protected by the basic law. 
this law, maybe it, it goes further than it should in restricting those rights. Is it not legitimate to then rely on the protection that the basic law offers for that, that particular right and to say, hey, th this law should be struck out? Well, Cliff, if you have a set of statutes of ordinances, all right? Mm -hmm. If you cannot assume that each one of those is constitutional. If you think that each one of those now must be tested by measuring the norms and values represented by that, that statute against the now the basic law, then basically you're saying there's no rule of law because you, you cannot do that. And you, you you, you're not even allowed to do that for the simple reason that there's Article 63 of the Basic Law, which basically says, look, anything which is inconsistent has been taken out. Everything that remains is the set of statute laws that govern the Hong Kong SAR, right? So that screening process as to whether mm -hmm. This set of thousand odd statutes have gone uh, uh, is, is consistent with the basic law. That process has already been gone through before the handover, right? So if you want to say that there's something unconstitutional about uh, a law, well, you, uh, you can say that a law passed after 1997 by the leg legislature, not having gone through the section, the Article 63 process, uh, can be challenged more easily. That's all you can say. Now, I mean, a constitutional challenge, just think, think of what that means. The matter has been, of course, gone through the government process to a policy, form a policy, and eventually uh, becomes a bill. And the first reading is then put before the legislature, right? Uh, then it goes into committee. And then eventually there's a second reading, and then there's a third reading, and then the assent of the chief executive. Now, now that process has already gone through in the course of which any point you wish to argue as to whether it's consistent with the basic law should and would have been argued in the legislature. That is what the legislature is there for. So when it comes to enforcement in a court of law, it will be or has to be a very exceptional case where you can actually demonstrate that despite this massively elaborate process, nevertheless, there's a provision which is you know, unconstitutional. Uh, it, it infringes some basic right, which is protected in the basic law. That would be a very, very exceptional case. Now, this exceptional case has been uh, put on the, on the table as if it's a regular occurrence. Every time uh, a client of a, of a barrister is charged with a, an offense, the first thing is to see whether the charge is constitutional. Well, how can you run a community under the label of rule of law by such, such, uh, such, uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, so, so I won't what, use what, the adjective. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what safeguards are there then? I mean, we, we have a situation in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, as you know, there, there is <clears throat> no meaningful opposition uh, in the legislature. Um, I mean, that, that may continue, uh, that situation. Uh, <clears throat> the judiciary acts as a, as a check and a balance yes. uh, on <clears throat> the powers of the, the executive, make sure the government is acting within the law, is acting constitutionally. Yes. Um, same, same with the legislature. Um, how well prepared, I mean, what, what you're saying is that uh, <clears throat> relying on the, the basic law should be something which is done very rarely, uh, and it should be the common law uh, that we are looking to. But how, how well equipped is the the common law uh, to protect uh, rights and freedoms? The common law 
is replete with safeguards of personal rights and liberties. The basic personal rights and liberties that we're talking about, the inviolability of the home, uh, that uh, the integrity of the person, that uh, uh, unless you, there's some statute that authorizes a policeman mm. to stop mm. and search you, the common law would protect you, for, for example, from that um, invasion of your, of your pers personal integrity and so on. All that is common law. That has been on, on the table for years and years. Now, no, nobody, nobody has ever complained, as far as I can see. I, I practice uh, common law in Hong Kong for 32 years. I, I've never heard one complaint about the inadequacy of the common law and protection of human rights or, or property rights or any other rights that you like to talk of talk about. No, I mean, that, that's complete answer, isn't it? The protection is well, the effective, effective administration of the common law, which the uh, basic law gives Hong Kong under, uh, as part of Hong Kong's autonomy. That's a crucial aspect of the autonomy. Now, every time, every time, a judge gets trapped into a situation of debating with counsel the common law. What is the judge doing? The judge is actually cutting away from Hong Kong's autonomy. Why do I say that? It's because the ultimate interpretation of the basic law is not in the Hong Kong courts. It's in Beijing. So every time a Hong Kong court purports to determine your rights or your liabilities under the basic law, right? That can be always reversed in Beijing. So potentially every time a judge plays or allow counsel to play these games, the judge is put cutting away under his own feet from his own autonomy. And they, they can't see that. But it's not always possible, is it, to find a, a common law solution? Uh, I mean, a, as you say, um, you know, the, the common law is not going to help. Mr. Litton, you back with oh, us? Yes. Hi. Right. There you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. Um, our freedom of expression uh, was briefly curtailed. Um, <laughs> it has been uh, restored to us. Um, <clears throat> The point, the point that I was making, just, just to put it very simply, um, is that uh, you know, if you look at the development of human rights law internationally um, over recent decades, uh, uh, in order to uh, protect human rights uh, successfully, do you not need to rely on an instrument like the basic law rather than just relying on the, the common law? That was my point. It's the common law which protects your basic human rights in every sense of that word. The only new right you can say that the um, Bill of Rights and the basic law has actually created beyond the common law is probably the right of privacy. That the common law never actually evolved principles comprehens comprehensively to protect rights of privacy, which seems to be more or less now accepted to be a an, an, uh, right entrenched via uh, constitutional development. I can think of no other right apart from the right of privacy, which is not actually encompassed by the common law. No. Okay. I'll, I'll be happy to be corrected on, on the score. Okay. Perhaps we we have some some questions uh, coming in from from our par participants. Mm -hmm. um, one I was going to ask you anyway. Um, it, quite a uh, uh, a chunk of your new book uh, deals with the the national security law, um, yes. which uh, yes. which of course has been uh, uh, a very big issue in Hong Kong mm. uh, in recent times. 
uh, Nick Chan is asking, you know, what is your assessment of the, uh, the national security law? Um, uh, you, you set out your thoughts in, in the book. Um, perhaps you could, could you uh, briefly give us your, your thoughts on uh, uh, that law and it, its impact on Hong Kong? How much time do you give me for this? <laughs> no, I, I think I don't think it, it's possible to answer that question in, in a few minutes. I mean, what do I think about it? Well, one. All right. Okay. Let, let, let me. Let's, well, let, let, let's narrow it down. Let's narrow okay. it down, shall we? Yeah. Um, I, I recently moderated a a, a webinar uh, where one of the panelists was Lord Faulkner, uh, the uh, Shadow Attorney General in the UK. Yeah. Uh, who has been very critical of developments in, in Hong Kong, uh, including the national security law. Uh, uh, now, he was focusing on Article 55, and in your book, you also talk about Article 55. And uh, but this is the part of the national security law that says cases can be taken from Hong Kong in certain circumstances and tried in mainland China. Yeah. Uh, now, Lord Faulkner said that, uh, this creates a, a massive hole, the words he used, in Hong Kong's rule of law, and it makes the, the legal system in Hong Kong a charade. <clears throat> so what, what is your response? Do we need to be concerned? You know, we have all these safeguards in Hong Kong. We're very proud of our legal system. We know it's different to the legal system in mainland China. Do we need to be concerned about this provision which provides for certain national security cases to be tried in mainland China instead. Well, I wonder whether Lord Faulkner actually has read carefully Article 55. There are three circumstances where the matter can be taken over by the courts in the mainland. Okay. Now, in relation to number two and number three, I can't see how anyone can possibly say that that is not justified. Two is where Hong Kong is unable effectively to enforce the law, right? Now, this is a national law, and this regional court is unable to effectively enforce the law. Who, who then enforces the law? Whitehall? It has to be in Beijing, or perhaps let it be lawless, that, that this becomes a lawless region. So when you come, to, when you look at one of the three circumstances, number two, surely Lord Faulkner is not going to say, well, if that should occur, then well, well, I shall give you my opinion that let the rabble reign in the streets of Hong Kong. I mean, would he say that? No. Um, so, so, okay. So one circumstance is okay. if, if there, there is some... No. Uh, dramatic event in Hong Kong yeah. uh, and uh, handling the cases is beyond the, beyond the, the, <clears throat> the capacity. Kong, right. <clears throat> Number three is even more grave situation. Basically is a war situation. Imminent threat. Major and imminent threat has occurred. Okay. A war. Now, now missiles are flying in this Taiwan Strait coming in, in, in Hong Kong's direction, etc, etc. So two and three Everyone with any sense of, of moderation and justice and equity and so on would say, look, well, of course. So you, your focus is only on one. It has to be, isn't it? And what does one say? It's a case so complex because of the involvement of a foreign, currents, uh, foreign country or external elements, uh, which makes it difficult for the Hong Kong courts to exercise jurisdiction over the case. So you have foreign elements involved, you have um, foreign countries involved, so it becomes an, an, a national thing really rather than a regional thing. And then in that case, the, the provisions in that article apply. Well, isn't that also reasonably reasonable? Well, so, so this is a provision that will would only be exercised in the most extreme circumstances. Yes. 
Uh, but we have seen there have been some uh, suggestions in, in pro-establishment uh, media in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, when Jimmy Lai was briefly uh, uh, released on bail, there, there were some, some suggestions that, that maybe uh, his case should be moved to mainland China. Uh, uh, is, is there a, a danger uh, that, uh, and, th and this was something Lord Faulkner was, was suggesting, is that, uh, uh, <clears throat> is there a danger that if it looks as if, you know, maybe the courts are not going to rule the right way, uh, that a case could be taken away from Hong Kong uh, and, and tried in mainland China? <laughs> or do you think that, that's fanciful? I mean, that, that's a supposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, people are saying when, when, for example, the um, amendment to the um, Fugitive Offenders Ordinance was being debated, and um, people were saying, oh, well, this would uh, enable agents, you know, come across the border and just snatch people uh, for trial uh, across the border. Well, I mean, you can say anything you like, but <laughs> your, your comments have to be founded on, on, on basic facts. And, and here, uh, from my reading, I mean, of course, the three circumstances in Article 55 are extremely rare. We hope to God number three will never occur. It will be a situation of major war for missiles flying and so on. And, and number two, well, if the Hong Kong courts for some reason are, are unable to perform its duties, I mean, let the rabble sort of rage in the streets. So you see, you see how exaggerated people like Faulkner is. I mean, <laughs> He talked like a rabble rouser. He's not talking like a lawyer. And that's part of the trouble. Uh, part of the trouble. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've, you've uh, been reading uh, Nuri uh, Vitachi's latest book. Have you, have you read that? Because that, I, I have. I'm going to recommend that book later on. <laughs> and, and very slowly, very methodically, in a sort of self-deprecating way, he leads into the story of how much there has been outside influence agitating in Hong Kong. Really using Hong Kong, as far as I can see, as if it was the Gdansk on the Baltic Sea in 1988, 87, 88, when the Solidarities uh, Movement was formed, alliance with the Catholic Church, which eventually brought down the whole of the Soviet Empire. The story seems to be that now Hong Kong has become the Gdansk of the 1980s. And this is the little kernel of irritant where the evil Chinese empire in the Western media's eyes is to be brought down. Well, I uh, let, let, to the provinces, so. let the provinces be fractured, hmm. you know, the warlords to reign back in Yunnan province and Guangxi province, and of course, you know, Hong Kong become an independent, owned by our, our, our ruled by our own warlord. But I mean, you you do in in your book. I, I did want to ask you about this because you're you're quite critical of uh, the the foreign media uh, in your book, in part oh, yes. of your book. Oh yes. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, this is the Foreign Correspondents Club, and so we, yes. we have an interest in in criticism uh, of uh, mm -hmm. foreign media. Uh, now, you, you describe in your book the, the protests in 2019 as an insurgency. Yes. And you talk about thugs on the front line. Yes. Um, uh, you, you also, um, with regard to foreign media reports, uh, you say that there was no sympathy shown for the silent majority in Hong Kong who were cowed by their protests and their lives ruined. Um, that, that's quite a sweeping statement, isn't it? To say that the, the majority of people in Hong Kong were cowed by the protests and their, and their lives ruined. Um, I mean, we, we did have an election at the end of 2019 uh, uh, in which the, the Democrats won a landslide. Uh, uh, on on what, what do you base your, because you're, you're, you're attacking the foreign media uh, for, uh, uh, for not, showing sympathy for the majority of people in Hong Kong. But what, what do you base that, that statement on, that the majority was cowed by the protests? 
Well, certainly in November 2019, I felt cowed at the Hong Kong University, mm -hmm. and so did my colleagues. And when I talk about people's lives being ruined and so on, you know, I think of the the, the small people, the shop owners, the small shop owners, the, the street uh, hawkers, the people who run small lean-to sort of uh, outlets, you know, in, in Mong Kok and Sham Shui Po and in uh, Causeway Bay and North Point and so on. Now, how, how do they feel? How, how have they fared? In, in the from from about June 2019 onwards until they got the double whammy with the COVID-19 in uh, March and April 2020. Well, am I exaggerating in expressing sympathy with people like that? Uh, friends who have difficulty in getting their children to school? Uh, their, their lives ruined because MTR station after MTR station trashed. The one at Hong Kong University was trashed. Mm -hmm. um, well, when have the Western media ever expressed any sympathy, any concern about the lives of people ruined by these thugs? Well, I think, again, you have to be a little careful about you know, <clears throat> uh, generalizing about uh, the Western media. Um, uh, I, I think there, there were reports um, about, uh, 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 about the, the violence that we experienced um, and, and those that were, were on the receiving end of it. Um, <clears throat> yes, yes, there were, and their voices were just completely drowned by the cacophony of condemnation from the rest. Okay, maybe I'll uh, turn to, because uh, I want to get as many questions in uh, as, as we can in the time that we have uh, available. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, Kinming Lu. Uh, so your, your campaign has been running now for Five years. Um, have you received any feedback from your former colleagues on the bench on the issues you have raised? And if yes, could you share with us? If no, what is the reason for their silence? Now, you might be said to have been quite rude about some of your, your former colleagues and, and the, the lawyers uh, <laughs> appearing before them. Uh, what, what feedback have you had? Let me just try to answer my dear friend Kim Ming's question. Number one, uh, Ken Ming, I have not yet received any death threats, okay? Well, I'm pleased to hear that. Number two, I've had no feedback whatsoever from any of my former colleagues, okay? Number three, I've had very little contact with the legal profession itself. And the only members of the practicing legal profession are friends who basically agree with my views, but feel that they're too unorthodox, too radical to be given expression themselves. As regards law students with whom I've had much contact in the last four or five years. They are confused. They see the power of the arguments I've been making clearly. But when they go through the process of learning the law and learning Hong Kong law, mm -hmm. they have to learn from Hong Kong judgments. They're not taught to be critical of those sources of law. So they have not actually developed a critical habit of examining these Hong Kong laws of, made by Hong Kong judges 
So they, they are a very unhappy mob. And, and uh, I, I think that, that, that sooner or later, the message that I've been trying to, to distill will get through because that is, is, is how the rule of law is supposed to work. Not, not dissolving into clouds of, of words, of, of theories, of uh, arcane analyses and so on, which bear no relationship with the actual issue and problem on the ground. I mean, when you, when you, when you, I'm sure you've tried to read the 100 page judgment of those two judges, Lam and Chow, the first instance, 100 pages of it. Mm -hmm. And eventually 325 pages of text from the judiciary came to resolve the entire issue of the face mask case to say that none of that is of any relevance whatsoever. And it dissolved into, in, 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 into nothing after 320 odd pages. Now, how can the rule of law prevail in an environment like that? I mean, that, that judgment from, from, from Chow and uh, of, of, of Godfrey Lamb was 18th of November, 2019. At the very height of the insurgency, the Chinese uh, university campus was under siege. The Polytechnic University was under siege. The, Ho, the, the Hong Hong uh, tunnel had been blocked. And, and Hong Kong was on the teetering on the edge of disaster. If one unit of the police had said, look, we've been arresting these people 48 hours, they, they let out because we can't def, uh, def, identify them. They don't carry their ID cards. They just sit there and they know damn well that after 48 hours they have to be released they don't even have to take police bail and they go back next day and start writing again nothing we can do we're not doing this anymore if one unit of the police force had done that at the end of november december january february hong kong would have been finished now in the midst of all this Ho oh, hum, 100 pages of stuff, let's talk about this tackle, talk about that, uh, and strike down the entire edifice that this law, which is on the statute book since 1922, to give emergency powers to the chief executive in a situation of emergency or public danger, well, that law is inconsistent now with the new constitutional order. I mean, the new constitutional order. They assume the powers and the rights of the majesty of the National People's Congress and say, now we conceive this to be the new national order, which makes that statute that gives power to the chief executive to deal with real emergencies, no, nope, not compatible. But might, um, might it not be seen as a strength of our legal system that even at a time of crisis, uh, these <laughs> issues... Thought, uh, <laughs> are considered uh, yes, by yes, our yes. courts and, and yes. are aired and are worked oh, through yes. uh, and eventually you, yes. you, know, you get to the... King Anderson and, 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 and all that, yes, uh, Lord uh, Atkins' judgment. <laughs> that, that was... Because, because what, 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 you're, what you're advocating um, in, in, in your book, uh, I think you say that... Uh, uh, this case and, and others that have been brought and explored um, in the courts uh, should have been dismissed at a very early stage. But do you not think that there is something that in allowing people their day in court at a, at a time uh, when we have deep political divisions in Hong Kong, at a time when people are being urged to, to understand uh, how the how these decisions are made, um, is there not some benefit uh, in, you know, even if the case ultimately is going to be dismissed, in at least allowing the arguments to be aired uh, and uh, providing some, some reasoning for the decision? 
Well, yes, by all means, argue at you freedom of expression, Article 27 of the Basic Law. Go to the Foreign Correspondents Club. <laughs> I mean, you can say anything you like, but a court of law is a place where rights and liabilities are determined, not a place like Hyde Park Corner in London to give free expression to people's views. And when, when you say their day in court, whose day in court, I ask you? The lawyer's day in court? I mean, who actually of the Hong Kong public have an interest in seeing the emergency regulation ordinance of 1922 to be struck down as unconstitutional and taking away from the chief executive all powers of any kind to deal with any emergency and to boot because of that all the regulations governing face masks and so on have also crumbled to the ground. Now, who has an interest in that apart from maybe the lawyers? Can I, uh, because as we're, uh, uh, we're beginning to run out of time, I want to get as, uh, as many questions in uh, as I can. Um, and there we, we've had a couple of questions that are looking to, to the future. Um, uh, uh, what, what is the outlook? Um, if I can combine two questions, um, maybe. Um, if nothing changes, you've been very critical of the judiciary. If nothing changes, what is the outlook as we head towards 2047, um, when the, the guarantees um, in, in the joint declaration, um, <clears throat> uh, well, they're no longer guaranteed. Uh, uh, and how, uh, how is the, the Hong Kong system and the mainland system, how are they going to, to work uh, together? You've talked about in your book, the national security law being part of that evolution of one country, two systems. How do you see the, the future? I've got two answers, Cliff. One, I'm a retired judge, not a retired prophet. <laughs> okay, so, so how this evolves in the next, now I was going to say 20 odd years, but I think the, the, the clinch will come not certainly will not come, come on the last stroke of midnight on the 30th of June 2047, that's for sure. So the clinch would come, I think, within maybe five or six years as to whether the common law system can be the governing system for the Hong Kong SAR beyond June 2047. Mm -hmm. now, for stability and prosperity, everyone, I think, everywhere, mainland Hong Kong, even London, I suppose, would uh, accept that when you have a, a legal system that actually works and functions and so on, you should not dismantle it and try to replace it because there would be total chaos for many, many years, for generations maybe. So how to ensure that the common law would actually go through beyond 2047? Now, that is the key issue. How to make it work? The answer is to start with the decision makers for that critical issue as to whether the common law goes through to beyond 2047 is going to be in Beijing with a little bit of input from Hong Kong, but the main decision maker must be in Beijing. If they pick up something important like the, the face mask law, 100 pages, I mean, nobody can understand it. You can't understand, I can't understand, nobody can understand it. And who, who, who has the time and patience to read through 100 pages and then get someone have to, have it to translate into Chinese so that they can then perhaps understand it? I mean, look, just exercise common sense. That system is not sustainable. It has you said, to... sorry, you, you, say, you say in your book, there's a need for a change in judicial culture. How, how is that to be brought about? Well, five basic points. Effective action, discipline of law. The law is, has a cutting edge, uh, focus on remedies, 
and the courtroom is not for, for debating. Now, adhere to those five principles and you would find that this, this, this system would work itself out in an effective way. Five principles, Good. not one less. Okay. Well, you say, you say you're not a prophet, um, but are you confident or pessimistic when you well, look ahead? I'm, I'm always an, an, an optimist. I, 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 I believe in the goodness of human nature. I believe, believe that human nature is rational, ultimately, and therefore I am optimistic. Okay, we're, uh, we're approaching, we're, <clears throat> I'm going to run over just a little bit uh, because we, we lost uh, a little bit of time. Now, I'd just like to ask you the question we ask all our speakers. Um, what are you reading? I can show you. What books would you recommend? I'm sure that you've all read it from the, in the Foreign Correspondents Club. I'm only on to uh, page 105 because I'm reading it with great care. This is the... Um, new book by Nuri Vitachi called The Other Side of the Story. I, I read, I've always read his stuff with admiration, but this in particular, this self-deprecation, this touch of humor, this humility, but this basic authenticity, honest with himself and therefore honest with his readers, really stirs my great admiration. And he tells the story very gently really from the, from the time of the first reading of the um, uh, return of uh, the offenders ordinance, the so-called extradition ordinance. And he reminds us that actually there were two things on the table. There was the return of fugitive offenders, which has created all the conspiracy. But at the same time, there's also provision for mutual legal assistance for the recovery of assets. And these two uh, pieces of le legislation comes from the G7 um, Action Task Force for really sophisticated sophistication has got uh, jurisdictions. They've got to help each other in order to you know, maintain the rule of law internationally. And that's what this is all about. And he explains that now with great care, with total accuracy, in a way that any layman would have understood. And he tells us what the process would have been in law had a request for um, return of, uh, of a fugitive to wherever it may be, it could be mainland China. And one of the safeguards and so on, he explains this extremely carefully. And, and he, he, he deals with it. Look, uh, he says, I'm not a politician. I'm just a journalist, you know. I'm humble me. I, I go and join the, the mass, mass marches, you know. And, and then suddenly you realize that he, 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 he realizes that things are really going wrong because there's some organized uh, malevolence at foot now. And he talks about, for example, the um, Mong Kok riot of uh, February 2016. How does this come from, uh, you know, happy evening near, near Chinese New Year into this, this vicious attack on the police? And, and, and from that core, he, he seems to develop the story that, look, there's foreign assistance, foreign uh, malevolence at work uh, and that's how the peaceful march uh, in early June then morphed into an insurgency and I'm reading this with great fascination and great admiration and through you I wish to say thank you to Nuri Vitachi I think everyone in Hong Kong should read this okay well <clears throat> thank you very much Mr. Litton um, <clears throat> there's there's we could spend uh, uh, several more hours, I think, uh, while discussing Nuri's book and the issues raised in it, um, uh, as long as, uh, as well as the broader issues we've been talking about today. It's a great pleasure to, to speak to you again. I, I do hope we can uh, welcome you back to the FCC in person uh, uh, in, uh, in maybe easier times uh, uh, if this uh, pandemic uh, goes away. But uh, Thank you, everybody, for, uh, uh, for viewing, uh, for sending in your questions. Uh, and uh, thank you once again, Mr. Litton. Um, all the best. And thank you, Cliff, for being such a charming host. Thank you. Thank you.